When Johannes Brahms rose to fame as a young composer in the 19th century, there was a clear absence of works in the symphonic genre to emerge from his output. With the exception of early serenades and his first piano concerto, his orchestral focus was long spent on completing and revising his first symphony, which would not be published until 1876, or his opus number 68. However, a young Brahms had dedicated three years' time to completing and orchestrating a requiem piece for choir and orchestra in his German vernacular. Aiming for a secular expression of humanistic emotion through biblical reference, his choice of including German text, and even titling the piece, Ein Deutsches Requiem, wasn't a nationalistic act akin to that of his other romantic contemporaries. This piece was set to be a personal indulgence with text chosen by the composer, while remaining true to absolute tradition. Compositionally speaking, the Requiem's long duration of conception allowed the form to be established as poised and structured, with symmetry prevailing as its unique hallmark. My goal while examining a small fraction of the German Requiem is to analyze musical and thematic symmetry within both the first movement and the work's large-scale form. These opening 14 bars compact the first movement's harmonic tonal scheme into a small microcosm, foreshadowing the upcoming moments. A warm and resonant pedal in F major played by the lower strings, horns, and organ lay the groundwork for emerging upper strings to tenderly weave contrapuntal lines in a conjunct voice-like manner. In measures 10 and 11, a brief implication of the dominant of Neapolitan, D-flat major, occurs before an augmented sixth chord grounds the music back in the home key of F. Interesting to note that there is a lack of violins in the first movement. Take a listen. This F major, D flat major, F major tonal scheme is already a symmetrical structure appearing within the piece's opening bars. Zooming outward to the rest of the movement's harmonic framework, it could be separated into three areas, although this is not as straightforward as it may appear. The opening choral gesture of a rising major third followed by a half step in the same direction is set to the German text Selig sind die da led tragen, or Blessed are they that mourn, in English. Several tranquil and ethereal moments of textured dialogue occur between the orchestra and chorus before a deceptive cadence in the parallel mode changes color on the text Die mit Tränen sehen, or They Who Sow Tears. This is the first instance of D-flat major. Erupting in a joyful Werden mit Freuden ernten, or Shall Reap in Joy. This section is immediately defined by a different character. However, it almost prematurely returns to the same F major section from the opening following a descending D flat major scale. A complete cadence in F major never occurs. We are left harmonically suspended in the dominant before another hearty iteration of the D flat major section immediately follows. Once this episode is subdued, Brahms cleverly incorporates the thematic material from the opening of the work, the rising major third motive, as a modulatory device from D flat major back to the home key of F. The choir recites the familiar Selig sind die da led tragen. We've made a full return to the original key and will remain there until the movement's completion. Astonishingly, while so much has happened in the central developmental area, the movement even then maintains symmetrical shape. Both D-flat major episodes surrounding the central F major cadence form greater symmetry structure levels that reflect the compositional intention even if we zoom out further and observe the entire work's thematic and harmonic compilation. 
each movement forms a corresponding symmetrical shape around the centerpiece fourth movement. One corresponds with seven, two with six, and three with five. I'll briefly illustrate conceptual thematic ideas that link the mirrored structure together. On the complete other end of the spectrum, the seventh movement also presumes the same key as the first, F major. Its harmonic tonal scheme, however, employs the inverse intervallic motion of the first movement, modulating up to the chromatic median of A major, rather than down to D flat major. The opening text reflects that of the first movement, Selig sin die Toten, or Blessed are the Dead. After such a long odyssey through six other movements, the seventh movement's inclusion of Selig Zind drives home the symmetrical grounding point. Regarding the central movements, their thematic symmetry reigns prominently obvious to listeners as well. Two and six both pose dramatic questioning statements, each respectfully reaching a high point of intensity with a fugue. The third and fifth each incorporate soloists, the third a baritone, and the fifth a soprano. Their thematic concepts are mirrored around the fourth movement chorale, which stands as the frequently performed centerpiece of the work. I hope that with these structures in mind, significance can be found within the emotional and musical journey Brahms lays out for performers of the famous Requiem to follow. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed.